I'd like to start off with the panel. Karibuni sana. Thank you so Thank much you. for being part of the session. Pleasure. Yes. And just to set the stage for our conversation this afternoon, what does God-led engineering, finance, and IT look like? And herein, I'll just start with, allow me to start with finance, Marupe. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As our, my fellow speaker shared, I also feel nostalgic because I, about 10 and a half years ago, uh, we were joined in holy matrimony in this very uh, church. And so it's a pleasure to come back. So to your question, what does finance-led leadership entail? I want to take us back to the Bible and that everything is about God. When we are born, how we grow and what we become is unknown. Nobody is born knowing how his life or their life is going to turn out. But we have this faith that we are born into, that we come to find about and learn, that uh, is enshrined in the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. Now, faith is a substance of things not seen. And so when I speak from my profession as a finance uh, expert, Let's say way back in high school, I didn't know that I, would, I wanted to be an, a chemical engineer. I didn't know that I was going to finance. But when I came out of university, I joined Strathmore, I joined the University of Nairobi, and then get into the world of finance as an academician, it is not what you become ultimately. Uh, it was shared here that leadership is not when we find the titles. Is not when we assume those roles and those positions. But you have to set your mind, set this vision early enough and partner with God that he may go with you to this journey where you purpose to go. To. And so for me, it has been a day, day in, day out walk with God because I have come to learn, I have come to appreciate, I have come to understand on a sequential basis from where I, I was a student to the world of employment and ultimately into business and self-employment. So for me, our being God-led in the world of finance is a daily walk with God, is a daily journey of revelation that never ends. Even now, there is still much more that I need to learn, to grow, to appreciate, to understand but it's also an opportunity for me to reflect back and share what my experience has been because as some of our professionals here, I was here maybe 10, 11, 12 years ago. Thank you very much for that, Marube. I feel like I can, I can trust you a bit more with my <laughs> books of accounts. Yeah. Uh, allow me to now switch to Gladys. How does God-led IT look like? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, since seems everybody is feeling nostalgic for being here, I think I'll take that opportunity to also feel the same. I was here 20 years ago as a youth in this church. 20 years. Some of you are not born. Anyway, that's not the topic. <laughs> IT or technology is what I would call the most aggressive and emerging kind of um, skills and uh, opportunities that are there. And just as my colleague uh, Marube has said, God is the initiator of everything. I think the Bible says that he's the author and the finisher of our salvation. In the same way, everything that initiates from man, from getting the skills, are usually by, by God's leading. And so when we talk about God leading us in the area of technology, we are saying he's the one that is behind the wheel in bringing up innovations. You know, sometimes we look at innovation as if it's a negative thing, but actually, if you look at it, innovations and technology have provided us a platform where there is growth and everything now moves in a systematic way. The king, King David, says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He acknowledges that without God, there is nowhere we can go. And therefore, when it comes to technology, all the skills and all the discoveries that are taking place and the innovations, I still believe that the Lord is in them because man is no one without God. 
Oh, I love that. Absolutely do. Thank you so much for that, Gladys. And welcome back. And we're thankful that you chose to also interact with the youth and leave us with that powerful reflection. And so over to you. How does God-led engineering look like, Benson? Thank you very much. Uh, um, good afternoon, all. Yes, maybe before I get to explain how I look at God-led engineering, is I just wanted to give you a few background information for myself. Yes, please. I come from a Presbyterian family. So when I was in secondary school, that's when I changed, when I was in Form 2. And I, I changed from Presbyterian to Seventh Day when I was informed to through reading and someone. Now when I joined this church, I learned a lot about God and what he wants. And that made me, even when I chose civil engineering course to do it, as much as it was difficult, I made a decision not to read on Sabbath. I went through diploma, civil engineering. I can tell you, even if I was not reading on Sabbath, my grade was very high. I got a, a credit for diploma. I went for the degree. I was not reading, even if how hard the subject will be writing on Monday, I will not read on Friday evening. And I finished the course. I also got a, a credit. Now, when I got into the profession to study, the challenging thing that comes in engineering, engineering is to do solution. You have to find solutions to, to the challenges that are there. So civil engineering is more of, of construction, building, and coming out with solutions on how things should be done. Now, there are two challenges that you face uh, in, the, in the profession. One, you, have to, you are forced to work even on Sabbath because of the nature of work. Two, you have to compromise your standards to meet the needs of the contractor. As a client, you have to, sometimes you are faced with shortcuts, not to meet the standards. Now, to answer your question in terms of how do you look at the God-led engineering profession, from where I stand and from the background I stand is that God-led, you have to follow what God is, and that is to be obedient to God, even the standards. Normally, you would want to compromise the standards, for the benefit of the contractor, and even for your benefit, as much as it is possible. Now, God laid uh, engineering profession. God taught us to be obedient to him. And that obedience has to also to be demonstrated even in your professional work. So that has led me to, be, to maintain the integrity, if I may put it that way. Be it how tough it is, you have to maintain your integrity. People have to know that this one is, is, a, is a Christian, but not only a Christian, he's also a Seventh-day Adventist. And that calls to a point that when it comes to Friday, people know how, that you will not be involved. They will only involve you maybe on Sunday or another day. That's what I've experienced in life when you make it at the beginning of your profession that you are a, a Christian, but not only a Christian, but a Seventh-day Adventist, you will be exempted even in other things that need to be done on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Benson, and thank you for sharing so generously of your background. As I listen to you, I reflect on what CJ Emeritus just told us, that you are truly a testimony that those who make time for Christ Christ has time for them, and it has shown up. And you're not afraid of hard work. So thank you very much for pointing that out as well. Allow me to stay with you for just one moment and pick up on one key aspect you've spoken about. And I'm really reflecting on this as we think about recent 
um, a recent incidents that happened in Kenya in the Mbakasi area where there was an explosion in the middle of the night and that was due to compromising standards within that particular zone. But now just coming back to the whole conversation around integrity and you've already started on that. In your view, from your experience, what is the place of integrity in today's professional world? Thank you very much. Uh, let me, uh, in trying to answer that question, maybe to give two, if time allows, I'll give even three uh, examples on how integrity is eroded, especially as it comes to a, when you balance Christianity and also profession. In my career life, when I was working for Lilong Water Board, we had a project that the contractor was, was working on. So we used to, I was on the Kozatan side and the client side, so we were given vehicles and we, we, we were refueling fuel uh, the contractor was providing. So we, were, we had to go to contractor side to, 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 to refuel. So there was one day that I went to refuel. Then the managing director of that contractor called me to his office. And they, then we talked to, uh, about the project. Then later on, he was open enough and say, he wanted to give me a bribe. The question that we were talking about, he wanted to give me a bribe, a bribe in the sense that I should not be strict when it comes to measurements on site because the contractor is, is paid based on what he has done, and you have to certify. So I was one of the assistant resident engineer on site who was uh, responsible to certify. So he knew that if I bribe this one, whatever the contractor will be submitting for payment, I'll be just ticking and say you'll be paid. Um, so I, when he came to that point, and it, you know when Satan, when he wants to tempt you, that time I was broke. I was really <laughs> broke. And uh, when he offered that bribe, okay, I, I thought of God first. As much as I thought of my, <laughs> I was, I needed money, of course. But I said, if I allow this, then even more other things will happen. So I, I declined, and from that point, the managing director respected me even more before this instance. So that's one instance. The second instance, that's when I joined the African Women Bank, and that was in, way back in Malawi. Another contractor called me. We had a dinner at a restaurant. So at the end of the dinner, and when we were now walking to, the, to our respective cars, he took a bag and he dropped into my car, and then he drove. Then I said, what is this? Then I opened, it was 500,000 kwach, and that's a lot of money. I opened it, then I said, no, this has to, I have to give it back because I cannot take this. Actually, at African Roman Bank, just like the, the CGA said here, we are supposed to declare the gifts. When you receive a gift, you have to declare to the company. Uh, so I, said, I told him to say, I cannot declare this 500,000. Then people ask so many things to say, what, how come that you were given this gift? So I called him, he said, no, take it, no, use it the way you want it. I said, no, no, no. So he tried to make it difficult for me to give it back. Then he, finally he, he said, can you go to the uh, site, construct, uh, construct, contractor site, and find a foreman and give it to him. Then I drove, Then I said, give it to your boss, this man. So those are two examples. I have another one, but in the interest of time, you know, the devil will try as much as possible to derail our faithfulness to him. What I've kept in my mind is that, yes, we are living in this world. I am a civil engineer. But one thing that I keep in my, my, my mind 
is that we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. And while waiting for Jesus, I am a civil engineer to assist, to work in this world. And that keeps me uh, the faith that I have in him. So maybe to answer your question, there are a number of challenges that come along, but it is not easy. As I put it, like the first instance, I was broke, but the offer came um, when I needed to. So it was, a, it was a temptation, but I needed to demonstrate my integrity, and integrity is very key in everything that we do. Thank you. Thank you for that, Benson. And also for pointing out, huh? he could have used that time as, oh, this is the answer to my prayer. It is cash. Mm. It's been dropped in my car. But it's really listening to God's word and doing it fully, holy, and so that you're able to recognize what's a temptation and where the Lord truly fulfills his word. Remember earlier on, told, there are like a thousand different ways that the Lord will provide for you. And so we can hold him to his word on that. Just before I invite um, Gladys and Marube to comment, also on the same one, integrity, I'd also like to share, right from where we are, gift policies. And from the organizations where you are, just check if you have a gift policy. If you don't, you could be the one to design it, whereby materiality uh, levels are set, and these are communicated, and so you don't have to debate about was it a gift, was it a tip. Sometimes it's branded merchandise, but it might be very high value branded merchandise. As you heard CJ talk about, CJ Maritas talk about a very expensive wristwatch. It's a wristwatch, isn't it? We're just hearing about the value of wearing very nice watches, but that crossed a certain line. And so different organizations do set out very clear gift policies. If you don't have one, you can be the one to design that. I'll now invite Gladys to talk to us a little bit about integrity. Okay, so um, it's just a big challenge, especially working in an environment where you have the integrity yourself, but the people you're dealing with uh, are not you know, in the same uh, belief and faith. So it becomes, especially for us in business, usually you find that the environment here in Kenya can be very hostile, especially for people in business. You, you, you want to genuinely supply something to your customers, especially in the, in the public sector. But then, of course, you have competitors who are doing the same thing. So you find that you lose a lot in opportunities that uh, you are not able to compromise. So when you talk about God's leading even in business, it means that you as a person who carries integrity with you, you really have to trust in God that uh, he's going to lead you to the right people. Because you see, um, when you don't compromise, it's a loss of revenue for you, isn't it? Mm. Ideally speaking, as a human being, you, you feel bad. You see that, you know, I know I'm capable. I know I am the right person most of the time. But, you know, many people will come and just, you know, buy their way out and you're left there with, without not being able to supply. But what I have come to, I have gone through a journey in life that has made me to have a lot of confidence in God. I did not give my foundation. My foundation, I'm not even an IT expert. I'm a teacher by profession. That is the, the missing thing. I run an IT company and many times people ask me how did that all happen. I always say that God led me there because it is just dramatic. If I was to give my testimony or now I came out from the classroom as a primary school teacher and to how I became a CEO of a, a regional, I call it a regional re leading brand because we have presence in Kenya and uh, South and Eastern Africa. I feel like the same God that led me from, you know, growing me from where I was up to where, mm -hmm. is the one that is already seen ahead of what I can be. And so God has always led me into places where I meet people who have the same mindset as I have. It may not always be, you know, that you will meet people who are always, you know, not in the same mindset with you. God still has a people, you know. He still has a residue for himself of people who you will meet and you will click and you will you know, you will transact business in an ethical way. And at the end of the day, there's something that I always tell Christians. There's something, there's a place of God's favor in you. Sometimes you can even supply in a hostile environment. You are not the one that was needed. But when God's favor backs you up, you will find that in the end, you will still have an opportunity. So I want to tell everybody, the world here is very corrupt. That is for a fact. Kenya is a corrupt country. But that does not mean that you will not thrive. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, 
being in the audit profession now for about 15 years, integrity is something we face on a daily basis. You are either reviewing a company some investors want to buy, and so they, the motivation of the person selling is a high valuation, or you are looking at someone who wants to pay the least tax, so the motivation is to hide some revenue or inflate some cost. So how do you confront this on a daily basis? And there are outright instances where, as professionals, we are faced with even uh, what Elder said, personal material gain if you just looked the other side and if you just gave this favorable opinion or, you know, played ball, as it were. But the Bible in the book of Romans, chapter 8, has given us a promise. Chapter 8, verse 12, we are being told that we have sonship through the Spirit. Uh, Romans 8, 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to living according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Verse 17, very important. And if children, then heirs, uh, wakuriti, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, his son. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen? That it may appear that breaking the rules of the game and... Uh, being corrupt or failing the integrity test may give us temporary reprieve or temporary gain. But what is the long term? When God created this earth, he gave us dominion over everything. And so we are to take charge and have dominion on his place in his stead. And so even where we are as professionals, we do not fear because Christ has promised us his spirit is dwelling amongst us and with us. And so we do not have to help God in assisting ourselves. That wage is idea. No, there is more than that. That if we are found faithful in Christ, if we emulate Christ, if we stand with integrity, it's um, Shakespeare who said that the world or life is a theater and everybody is playing a cast at whichever time. You never know who is watching or who is following you. There is someone who is impressed by your integrity, and they are going to pull you out from that which you see that is a problem or a challenge or a loss, a temporary loss, and uplift you to a higher pedestal. So what I would want to appreciate or uh, I recommend to our fellow professionals is that let us look at the long term. We are building a career, we are building a profession, or we are building a business that we would want to inherit to our children and grandchildren. And so integrity is the backbone that is going to outlive us. There will come a time when we will not have the energy, there will come a time when we will want to exit. But putting God first, and being people of integrity will outlive us. So let us be encouraged with that, and that uh, even as we face these temptations, I call them temptations, if we overcome them, the glory is not just to ourselves, but to God. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for that. I hope you see how you can make it in this world by living God's principles and how much more he elevates you by choosing him. Gladys, allow me to come to you and pick up on part of what you've mentioned. We do not know your story. Please tell us just a highlight on how you came to be where you are. Okay, so it's a long story, but I will make it very brief. So myself, I'm a, I started as a tourism and travel trainee. <laughs> I had this expectation that I would become a lawyer like Phyllis. I believe she is a lawyer. 
But then my grades did not give me the right grades to go to the, to the university those days. You know? Those days, I think there were very few universities, so the chances were very few. So in out of confusion, I went straight into doing tourism and travel. Then finished, and I realized it was during the bomb blast time, 1998, for those who were around. And tourism sector went down. So I immediately changed my career and went into teaching. I did a, a primary school, we used to call it P1 those days, yeah, education level. And then I, I, I became a teacher. Luckily, I think I was, uh, by God's grace, I was lucky. I, I started off with the British standards, I mean, what we call them, British curriculum schools. So I quickly grew up as a, a teacher very fast, teaching the British uh, syllabuses, and I got an opportunity to go and teach in Southern Africa. So while I was in Southern Africa, I started off in a country known as Mozambique. Mozambique, for those who know, they speak purely Portuguese. It was by God's leading, by the way. Sometimes I keep asking myself why all that happened. So I got an opportunity to teach in Mozambique, which speaks purely Portuguese. So I taught there, and then after some time, I, I, I went now and got an opportunity in another country called Swaziland. So when I was in Swaziland, I pursued my education and just pursued my, I got a degree now in education from the University of Swaziland. But then when I came back to get married, say amen. 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 Uh, <laughs> because there was no reason to come back anyway, <laughs> from the way my career was progressing. I got an op when I came back, I was like, hey, do I go back to class? You know, after you've, grown, you've gone abroad, eh? diaspora, then you come back to Kenya, you don't want to go back to the same level you are. So my motivation to not go back to the same level that I was, I, was, I looked at myself and looked at the skills I had at that time. The main unique skill I had at that time was that I was able to speak Portuguese. So Portuguese is one unique you know, subject and the linguistic world is very thriving. So I got an opportunity to grow myself also as a lecturer. I started teaching Portuguese in all the, uh, the colleges in Kenya, language center, language solutions, and all those countries. I mean, not countries, but companies. So while I was teaching Portuguese, people also would call me to interpret the language. So I started working with the NGO world, interpretation, you know, uh, translation, translating books, and all that. So while I was there translating books, I got, I met an Italian, uh, I mean, two brothers, and they went to the Mozambique embassy, and they were looking for only a person in Kenya who can speak Portuguese. And for some reason, I was the only woman in Kenya wow. at that time that could speak Portuguese. Say God, God's leading. Oh, <laughs> so these people were coming to invest in Kenya, and they were now investing in a very unique field that, that at that time, there was really nothing like cyber security. So they wanted a Portuguese speaker who could help them to have a regional presence within Southern Africa the countries of Angola and Mozambique. And I happened to be the only one at that point. Remember, I was a lecturer, so I was also thriving in the area of interpretation and linguistics. But when I got myself hired a little bit to just go and open up their presence within Southern Africa, I got somehow interested in the technology space. Remember, I had nothing technology on me. Mm. But now I was very interested, and I saw that this industry will probably be longer thriving in future than where I was. So I got as employed in that company as a salesperson. I moved from being a teacher to being a salesperson and I was in charge of the southern... <laughs> with, by the way, teachers are the most flexible people in the world. Eh? So I moved quickly from being a teacher and I became a... We used to, we used to give ourselves a... We were salespeople, hawkers anyway, but they called us business development officers. <laughs> so I became a business development expert within the Southern Africa region. I was in charge of Angola, Mozambique, and Botswana. Then I served there for many years, and by God's leading, I grew up to the time that I needed to put up my own company. So DataSec was born 10 years ago, 20, 2014. I started it off as a joke. I had a contract with my boss that I could not serve the same areas that I was no, I was working. We call it an compete contract. So I started off in Kenya and Uganda only. But by God's grace, after my period of non-compete was over, we have now been able to have presses in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and of course the Southern African regions. So I want to thank God that that was just by God's leading. It's not something that I ever studied for. Of course, now I'm an IT expert. You don't become a CEO of an, an IT company and you don't become an expert. But that was just by God's leading, really, to be honest. Amen. Oh, meant to that.
Was there somebody who asked a question earlier on about what direction to take your career? Sometimes it's starting with what's in your hand. See the opportunity and run with it. And Gladys, to this day, cybersecurity, it's still a hot area. Yeah? It's still an area where we keep looking out for opportunities. And I'm, I'm so glad to now know you and know that you do business in Moz as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. Benson, please tell us a little bit more about your background, a highlight that led you to where you are today. Thank you very much. Um, I think you're, uh, I'm, I already said I'm a civil engineer. I did my master's in water resources engineering and management uh, in Zimbabwe. After that, then I joined a local contractor. Uh, when I graduated in Polytechnic in Malawi, I joined a local contractor. I worked for seven months. Then I joined the Long Water Board as an assistant planning engineer. So I was there. Then two years after, I joined the, pro the project. There was a multi-million dollar project funded by World Bank and the EIB. Now, during that period, the task, the task team leader, they call it TTL, World Bank Project, um, Bob Roche, they used to come every six months to supervise the project. Now, when they came, you could run through the project, supervise, they would guide you. So when I looked at him, he inspired me uh, to say, I think this, so he motivated me, and I desired that I should work like this. So the desire to join international organization came through the World Bank TTL, Bob Roche. Then later on I went for masters and I came back. Then thereafter, working through the organization, I rose from assistant to projects engineer and projects manager. So I joined ADB, um, ADB in 2008. Uh, when I joined the ADB, I joined as an infrastructure specialist so I was looking at water, energy, and transport in Malawi. So I worked uh, for 10 and a half years. There, my, that was as a local, local employee. But I wanted to get into international. So you can imagine all those 10 and a half years, uh, an opportunity could not arise in my field. So another op opening came. Now, it came in the programming, so I applied, so I got the job. Now, I got into the international um, level, but not in my engineering field. I went to Pretoria, that's where the position was. So whilst I was there in Pretoria, working in the same organization, another opening came in my field in water. I applied, now at a higher level. So I applied and I got it. I got the position and I was now moved from Pretoria to Nairobi. I'm here, like back into my engineering field, but detour from country programming. So this is something, maybe it should also be an example to other I could not have opportunities direct from the local position to international position in my field. But when another opening came in country programming, I qualified. And when another opportunity came in back in my field, I came back. So I'm back in my civil engineering work in water resources. That's why my position is water resources engineer, uh, officer, because I had to detour first. So, uh, to in briefly, this is why I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hearing the lifelong learners we have on this platform right now, always building, always developing their skills. And Benson, thank you so much. From the talent space, I appreciate that you've spoken about the detours that you take in your career to grow. 
it's not always a straight line up. It's not always I started at entry level, assistant manager, manager, on and on. Sometimes it looks at what are the skills you have, which is the opportunity that keeps you still aligned to your goal. How do you go for it? But how do you keep in mind your goal? And remember, this is a God-led goal. And so continue looking out for opportunities, taking them, continuing to transition. It gives you breadth and it gives you depth. And that's just the life that we live today. That's the world we're in. Thank you very much for sharing that. Over to you. Thank you. So my background allowed me to begin my career. It started off in uh, 1992. Uh, way back here in uh, Machakos, where I was the sales manager for Njugu Karanga. I can't hide the surprise on my face. I'm trying. <laughs> Please go it's on. important I mention there because now you can connect and relate to where I've come from. That time I was in class two and uh, we were living in Machakos. <laughs> But my dad used to work in, uh, in uh, Rongo, in, in South Nyanza. So when he would visit, he would come with uh, a sack of uh, njugu. So it used to be the njugu you would be made. And when I'm done with school in the afternoon, I would go to the roadside. Now maybe you call them hawkers. But that time it was a bit decent. I would sell out njugu every day. And it used to supplement uh, school fees. I was in uh, Machakos Primary from class one to class three. And then when we moved back to Kisi, that never continued until university and then after campus. So that was very important because it, at a very early age, I learned about business, about selling, about marketing. And you see the joy of getting money from an activity. So I did... Uh, Become Finance and SCCA, Strathmore University of Nairobi. I joined uh, Deloitte as an audit associate. And then after about uh, four years, I joined uh, U-Mobile. That time it was uh, ESA Telecom as their systems and processes manager, really the internal audit manager. I was uh, privileged to be the youngest manager and excited and thrilled about uh, a new career and, you know, growth only to go in and find that uh, the house was on fire and they were, you know, looking to sell. And so that is what even shortened my, my stay in uh, employment as I started thinking of uh, the exit strategy. And in 2013, July, uh, that was about one year before they exited the market, I formed a Burnley and Company where we are an audit, tax, and business advisory firm. Uh, we mainly, our market is here in Kenya, South Sudan, Juba, Somalia, and now in uh, DRC. So we do capital raising, help clients in uh, capital raising, doing due diligence, valuations, mergers and acquisitions. Yeah, that's what we do. And in the public space, I've also served as the chairman. I'm the immediate former chairman, if you call that emeritus of uh, Nyamira County Audit Committee. Uh, I, my term ended in uh, 2022. Oh, wow. Thank you for your service to the people. <laughs> I started from Jugu Karanga, right to mergers and acquisitions. Thank you for sharing that. Parents, there's a lesson right there. Yeah? In terms of what else do we expose children to? What else do we encourage? in this day and age. But still, and especially in this day and age, still remember integrity, and remember to still seek God's guidance as you go on in that. But beautiful lessons learned and started early on. Interestingly, as we've listened to them, have they spoken about any challenges they've experienced? Have you heard any struggles? I've heard a bit about that. But now I'll just bring it in a bit more and just ask you to share and allow me to stay with you a little bit. Just some of the challenges you've shared and lessons. Thank you. Some of the challenges and lessons in life will come. They'll be painful. They'll not be planned. And they will uh, ultimately character develop yourself. So 
in the interest of time, allow me to share one. Uh, so Burnley & Company is not the first company I formed or I, I started. I, I started another one before that with a friend of mine and uh, I lost it. Yeah, so he, he took over the company. I did have uh, control. And so this is the reality of business and the reality of life. It can happen. Uh, it's not to dwell in the past, but you know, to know now what next, because you, whatever we are just talking about here, you discover that maybe you go into partnership and you do not share um, attributes, you do not share the same faith or uh, outlook in life, and there are some limits uh, that you cannot get into. So for me, the challenge had been, um, my thought, my outlook had been different from what they were looking at, you know, about the long-term view and the short-term view, and so it had to come to a point where we had to part ways, and uh, I think in that scenario, I was like the loser. But having gone now separately, I see God's mercies and grace, and, you know, it's like uh, the song that Miaka uh, Ilio, Liwa Nanzige, Unarudishiwa. So, uh, not to give up in any battle or challenge that you uh, foresee or that you go through, but to have faith in Christ that he who started this will sure see it to conclusion. Thank you. Gladys? Okay, so, let's say me in 1992, when my friend Marube was selling the Bukaranga, I was also in business, but I was selling success cards. <laughs> uh, I was a class eight pupil in my boarding school in Kirinyaga, and so during the holiday I would buy success, success cards and I would sell to my classmates so that they can send their, to their classmates also success cards. <laughs> so that was my first business. Now DataSec, which is my current business, a cyber security company, is my fifth business. Wow. I have put up a tourism and travel company before. I have made shampoo. I have sold eggs from Wangigi Market to, to Kawangware. So when we talk about struggle in business, I mean, you can only keep trying. And one thing I can say is that if you are used to soft life, you can, please don't start business. Now, the biggest challenge I have had in my space right now is being, um, when, when you talk about technology, most of the time we think about men, isn't it? So you find that, and I want to encourage the ladies in this house here, and this is a message for you, that uh, technology, engineering, you will be branded with men. And so most of the time when you start thriving in that sector, people don't even trust you in the first place. And so I have had to struggle to position ourselves as a brand, not as a woman-owned company. But as long as you are moving everywhere, you'll always have those challenges of people asking, who owns this company? And when they hear, and I remember when I started my business, I used to hide myself like I'm not the owner of the company. Big mistake. I remember I used to carry my cards and I would say, sales and marketing, you know, and I would never want to declare that I was the owner of the company. But I, when I went into, there's a, you have to now put a lot of networking, uh, place yourself into networking areas, and I joined a mentorship program by Safaricom. We call it uh, Safaricom Women in Business Mentorship, where they only encourage women in the STEM area. Not only that, but they encourage women who are running businesses, engineering, IT, and all that. So when I joined that sector, it's when I realized there is no point of not myself calling myself a CEO of the company, because they give us, of, of course, chances, and there's a lot of learning. So that challenge of being in technology and a woman was, was there. But of course, you have to sell above, you know, above those kind of things. And one of, sorry to, if I'm taking the time, but I just want to, rem to tell you about one story that I went to one organization and I had sent my sales lady and she went ahead and she proposed, she talked about, and uh, proposed very good products for this organization. And so the, uh, the head of IT asked, can I see the owner of the company? So, because my MD wants to see the owner of the company. So I had to go. And I remember a very old man seated there and he, he dropped his glasses like this. And he said, you mean even women are doing these things of cyber security? So there's just that thing of people imagining that women are not good enough when it comes to tough things, isn't it? So that was a small challenge, but along the way, what I, have, I would like to tell the ladies is focus on what you deliver. That has been my way. As a woman, most of the time you have to prove yourself twice. A man can easily go and prove himself once, but you have to prove your, 
yourself twice and you must be right all the time. But the beauty is, in front of God there is no gender. And anyone, right now I can actually confidently say that there are male companies that have not even reached our level at the moment. I'm just taking a moment for that, especially in the course of this month when we've been celebrating the achievements of women and looking at, yes, women in STEM. So here we have it live with us today, testimony. Having started from where? Now it's success, success cards. cards. And then primary school teacher, then traveled to different parts of Africa and now being one of the leading technology companies in a very challenging area. Yeah? Um, I work in M-Pesa Africa and from where we sit, cybersecurity is absolutely critical, and there are new risks coming up every day. And so, just knowing and trusting that we're sitting with somebody who's invested in that, playing such a big part of that, and encouraging you to please join us. Thank you so much for sharing. Benson, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in terms of challenging times and also lessons learned, I think in my profession, as I hinted earlier, is that the fact that uh, the profession promotes when you are in Rome, do what the Romans do. You know, it's simple to say about it is you have to follow what others have been doing in the same profession, which I found to be, in some cases, contradictory to my belief, and it poses a challenge in that respect. Uh, I have a number of uh, less, I mean, examples that, just like the CG, I mean, this CJ earlier on indicated, to say we need to to learn to to do things differently. I think she also mentioned it. Yeah. So I will give you one example. When I was working for the Longota Board, you have different rates when you are, you are going to a conference outside your station. If it is full board, like everything is paid for, the rate of allowance is smaller. But if it is not paid for, the company pays more so that you are able to, yeah. So there was a time that we were invited to a conference. Like here, you are invited to Naivasha where you, you sleep over the old Mombasa, for example. So the information that came to the company earlier was that it was not full board. So the company provided us with rates that it is not full board. What it meant, we were given more money to support ourselves there. But when we went there, it was a full board. So what it meant, they gave us more money than they should. So we were a number of us in the company. So when I came back, I went to the accounts and I repaid back the balance. I, I, I calculated and say, because this is, was full board, the rates for the full board for this company is this, then I repaid. Now I remember one secretary for the financing. He said, what are you doing? We don't repay this. Go and take the money. I said, no, 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 no. The rates, according to what I know, the rates for full board is this. Let them. So I repaid it. It was taken as a, a light thing, but it was a way of also the integrity part. You know, those are the challenges that we face. In the, it may be seen as a small thing. But I, I wait on myself and say, I'm a Christian. It will, I'll be paid something, I'll be earning more of no, I was not supposed to. So it's something that we, yeah, young professionals here, you'll be challenged yeah, for sure. When you, people will say, you know, do as the Romans do it. You know? Do as we do. But as a Christian, we should, uh, we should keep it our back our mind to say, I think God said, earn what you have worked for, and not something, because it starts like that. Later on, bigger things will come and say, if I had done that that way, 
this way I also have to do it. So there are many challenges in, in the profession where we are, we, are fo we are like promoted or we are encouraged to do as the Romans. But as a Christian, you also have to be mindful that apart from being um, responsible to your bosses, we also have someone above who is God looking at us. Thank Amen. you. Amen. That's being a true steward and doing right by what is given to you. I'd like to stay with you for just one moment, Benson. Not everybody would make the same decision you made. And there are times when people could end up compromising, and that leads to a significant setback. In some cases, it can even be a run-in with the law. What advice would you give to a young professional who may have experienced a setback? Maybe they did not follow the correct path or the correct channels, and it led to a setback on their end or even a failure. What advice would you give to them? Thank you very much. I'll get back to my situation. You know, I, I was at the same position, I would say, like for 10 years. So my desire was to uh, progress. You know, everyone wants to move on, move on. So I said, should I still, when another opportunity came to go the country programming, country programming is like, administrative kind of just coordinating program, not the passion that I have in, in, in engineering, in civil engineering. So I applied as I indicated and I, and I was picked. I didn't know that I will, another opportunity will come back, will come in the, same prof, in the same field. So I was there, I, was, I detoured for three years, and after three years I came back to my profession. So I may also say the same. Uh, life may not be straightforward as it were, but where there's a will, there's a way. Where there's a vision, you know, there's a way. The best I can say to any youth that may be stagnant is, is to still wait upon the Lord. You know, Psalms 121, there's some say, there's a good verse, good verses, one to one to, one to eight. The first verse is, is a, a rhetoric question to say, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where comes my help. Verse two, it now answers, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and the earth. If we can wait, you, you, because you don't know the next thing will happen to you. Because you are stagnant, you think it will continue like that. But as you wait upon the Lord, for sure, you open up the way. Like for me, I had to detour because it was taking too long. You know, being on one position or one level, 10 years is too much. But when God opened this window, I came back and I am working with much satisfaction. Eh? my profession, because that's where I wanted to be. But it took a detour first to get back. So I would say it would be important for any youth to still wait upon the Lord. God has his own time. We may hasten the process, which may not be right, but to wait upon the Lord, God's time is the best. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn to yes. the one with the audit background. Audit are the ones who find these things out. Please, what advice would you give to somebody who's experienced a setback, some kind of running? Okay. Uh, it's important, uh, if I can take the analogy of uh, Safaricom, it's uh, I think the largest valued company in this region. When you look at the company, whatever document, website, any document they release, you look at the structure of the company. You see they have, you know, the CEO, they have management, you know, very well experienced and exposed professional. But over and above their technical know-how, their skills, exposure, and experience, they still are overseen by 
a board of directors and advisors. Why is that important? Because even with their skill, knowledge, experience gathered over the years, they still need a third eye, a bird's eye view, and someone to bounce off ideas and check on them. That is the most valuable company. When you look at you know, the great seasoned professionals, they still have people who advise them, people they listen to, people who you know, are tough with them. That is no difference from us as professionals. It is important that we also have in our spheres of life, wherever we are, at whatever level, we have people we can call upon as our trusted advisors. People who can mentor us. People we can learn from. Such that even if we have gone through the mud and we have messed up and we have fallen short of our expectations, we do not expect to have all the solutions by ourselves. But we have <coughs> someone I can call on to, someone I model ag uh, against, someone who has gone the journey that I hope to go through to advise me and help me where I have fallen short. So it's really important, even before going through the mistake, or even when we have already you know, gone through such a uh, points of uh, tumult in our lives, that we have people who are trusted, people who can tell us the truth, people who are invested in our success. I say that has been very important and is actually very important that we, we don't walk alone, that we have people that we can reach out to. Thanks a lot for that, Marube. You hear that? Have you? And allow me to borrow. Just as you've talked about the structure of Safaricom, for example. Now to ourselves as individuals to have your personal board of directors or your personal board to work with advisors. you or board of advisors to work with you through this journey. So even when things went south, yeah, there's somebody who can support you. And you know, we say that we rise by standing on the shoulders of giants. So beyond your peers, beyond the peeps you see around you, have somebody who's seen further ahead and they can support you through these difficult phases that sometimes you can get into. Gladys? Okay, so um, what I would say is this. In life, it's rare <laughs> that you will find somebody who has, you know, taken a straight path. And that is something that you need to have in your mind. In fact, I like the theme of the, the, this convention. Because when you talk about God's leading, it means it is not your own leading. Our own leading is usually a straight path, if you ask me. If I was to lead myself, maybe I would be a lawyer by now, okay? But now, God always has something that he has in store for us. And I want to encourage anybody that has lost in one hand or another, never to take it as a negative way. If you submit to the leading of God, that is the most important thing. Because you will always tell God, I don't know why this has failed, but I know you have a better plan. As long as I subject myself to your will, I know I'm in your hands. Many people have, you know, started their careers from being doctors and they ended up being maybe in, in a different business. What I always ask myself, it's not confusion. Don't ever think and look at yourself as if you're confused. One thing that you need to be sure of is, is God with me? Is God leading me where I'm going? The psalmist says that when the psalmist says that the Lord is my shepherd, at the end he says that sometimes he will lead me through the still waters mm -hmm. and there are days that he will lead me even in the, in the, in in the, the fire, isn't it? He says that even though I walk through the, 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 valley. the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah, the shadow of death. Mm -hmm. Yet there are sometimes he says, even when you lead me in the still waters, isn't it? He says sometimes that even you will, in the presence of my enemies, you are with me. So it means when God is leading you, you will find that sometimes you will move from one place to another. The question you should always ask yourself, am I in his leading? If you feel you're in his leading, then you should not worry. Start over again and again. To do five businesses is not a joke. I think I am the expert of contouring. I, there's something he's calling it. Uh, detouring. I am the history of detouring. I have found myself here and I feel I have settled. And I'm not saying that if God leads me to another direction, I will not go. I will be humble enough to follow him until the end. As long as you know he is with you and he's 
Interest is always the best one for us, not for ourselves. The one we give ourselves is not the best, but the one that God leads you into is usually where we will settle and it's always the best for each and every person. Just an addition. Yes, please. Tonight I'll be in a meeting and the title of the meeting, the topic is Success is not final, failure is not fatal. So, that's it. Success is not final, failure is not fatal. Powerful, thank you. And Gladys, thank you for sharing your story. It's not confusion. You know, people who knew me years ago are like, so Debbie, how is the world of accounting? And I'm like, I have no clue. I mean, people and culture. And that's where I am. And sometimes, I, because I studied BCom, finance, did the whole accounting thing, then now I'm in HR, but with people and culture. <laughs> but I really enjoy it. But there are some days, Gladys, honestly, there are days I ask myself, you know, especially when we're looking at the pecking order in these large organizations, the person who is most likely to take over from the CEO tends to be the CFO, tends to be. Though in KCP group, I'll just throw in, yeah? We have Paul Russo, who has been in the field of people for some time. But there are days in HR I ask, why is HR still begging for a place at the table? And I left the place right next to the CEO. But with God's leading, I think I get such fulfillment from my job. In some days, I'm truly thankful for it. If you allow me just to say something. Again, even if you get so many skills along the way, when God is leading you, you will realize that you will need this, these skills. Yes. I look at myself and I ask myself, I am the CEO of DataSec, but 90% of what I do is talk and sell and teach. I am a teacher. So these skills of me being a teacher have bladed so well in my career. I did tourism as a, as a first career, by the way. When I venture into new markets, I go to Mozambique, I go to wherever, I don't need a travel agency to get me a hotel. I don't need a travel agency to get me an air ticket. I do it myself. Wow. Yeah? I learned sales. I mean, a CEO, if you cannot, you cannot be a CEO who okay. sits in the office. Okay. CEOs are always selling. Yeah. I sell anything to anyone. I can even sell all of you, by the way. <laughs> so these are skills I have got along the way. And they are there. When God is leading you, everything begins to work for you, by the way. He makes everything to harmonize itself and work for you. Mm. So never regret that you did uh, finance and now you're in HR. You will need that finance one day mm. by God's grace. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gladys, indeed. Now there's one question, as, as we're briefing with Kate, there's one question which I was even told to put in bold. Please share current trends and opportunities in your fields. Allow me to start with Benson. Okay, for me, I, I'm working for African Development Bank. First, you need to have uh, a master's degree. I would, pro, I would encourage, if you only have a bachelor's degree, please try to move and find, I mean, get a master's degree. I think that's a starting point for an officer in, in the African Development Bank. And for those that have done even PhD, they stand even a better a better opportunity. So that's the first one. Secondly, there are many opportunities that are in the African Bond Bank, uh, be it engineering, be it lawyers, we have legal counsel, be it ed education, health. So uh, I would say in all sectors, but uh, what is more required is once in a while, visit our website afdb.org there are opportunities even as we speak now there are openings that are there that you can you can get uh, you can try uh, like for me as i said i also tried and the, by the grace of god I, you know god led and and i'm into this organization it's a good organization where uh, you have almost everyone that the nationality on this earth i think is there uh, you talk of europe americans indians i mean asians they are there and it's it's a good uh, organization which i think if we can have more of of africans it would be much much even much uh, better so there are opportunities to answer your question there are 
many opportunities, but the starting point to be an officer in the African Drone Bank, you have to have a master's degree uh, going forward. So I would encourage you in your career, please uh, move forward, I mean, move from the bachelor's uh, to master's. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benson. Uh, top of my mind now, what I can see in the horizon in finance is uh, there's climate financing that is big now. Uh, the issue around uh, carbon credits, if you can, uh, you know, get involved around that and do some research and see how you can uh, position yourself as an authority, it's a big space that is opening up currently. Recently, there has also been a, quite a good amount of inflows into especially Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa in, start, in terms of uh, startups. So a lot of uh, fintech, edtech uh, companies are being, you know, groomed and being sold around. So the space of uh, valuations and a uh, lot of uh, due diligence is necessary. And so if you can hone your skills around uh, those, you are also likely to be of great value in the ecosystem of, of the startups. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot for that. Yes, indeed, climate financing. We've not, take, we've not been very good stewards of planet Earth. And now it's calling back. And so it's becoming a bigger and bigger conversation. Okay. Thanks a lot for that. Gladys? Okay, um, the entire technology space, I would say that it has a lot of immense opportunities. Uh, sometimes when I talk to people and they know I'm in technology, they bring me laptops to repair, they bring me phones to unblock, and all, but that's not about technology. Technology is really vast, eh? and I can only speak about the space I am in. People are in infrastructures, others are in networks, so it's a big area. But one of the emerging areas that are there, of course, is artificial intelligence. You know that we are in need of so many data scientists, machine learning, things like you know, cryptocurrency is coming up. We have areas like where I am now, right now, in cybersecurity. Just two weeks ago, I looked for somebody to send to Somalia for one of our customers I could not get. We are really lacking a lot of expertise when it comes to cybersecurity. Yeah, so, I mean, if you were to think about a career within IT, I think the emerging areas like AI and all that are good, but before that, cybersecurity is really a space. As technology grows and advances, security becomes the core. So there's no way security is going. I would advise you know, anyone who has this interest Please find out what is there. We look for people we call pen testers. Pen testers are people that just test, you know, any bank when they are launching their internet banking, they have to test it to be sure that it is unhackable. So we are in need of hackers, but we call them ethical, ethical hackers. hackers. So we are in need of people who can just give um, help organizations to meet compliance standards. There are so many standards in the, the security space. You know, security standards are very many. You know, visa demands that you must meet some criteria for you to trade with them. So we are looking for all manner of people who can do compliance within security and also the technical side of it. Security assessments and things like monitoring, being able to see the wave, we call it uh, threats, being able to check the threats and be able to know what are the threats that organizations are facing. So I welcome everybody who can come to the cyber security space. If you want mentorship, I am here when I have the, the opportunity and we can you know, we work together in that journey. Thank you. And I can verify what they have all said. Upping your educational background, it helps. I, the world is definitely becoming a lot more competitive. So as much as you can invest in yourself, that is part of your personal financial management. And we'll be talking about that. But I do hope that even as you budget for yourself, whichever organization you're in, do not leave it to the organization to do all investment in you identify for yourself what you're keen on, set aside some money for it, invest in a good desk and chair in your house because you always learn. So just set up for yourself a nice comfortable space to always learn. Climate financing, carbon credits, I'm in FinTech, EdTech. Just looking at all the mergers, I left one organization after we had successfully merged and that was after we had acquired a different organization and I joined a joint venture entity. So when you're talking about mergers and acquisitions, in my lifetime, 
I have now been in a number of organizations and I nearly joined one that was just about to be acquired. And so it's definitely something that's trending and so being able to fit into the value chain of this does give you opportunities to develop your career. And yes, our cybersecurity team do not give us any rest. We're always looking out for skills in that area. Data science, as you talked about, machine learning, AI, definitely areas that are critical to us. But I'd like to flip this over to our participants as well. What are some of the trends you are seeing in your space? Now we've spoken a lot from a very technical bench, but the creative space is also becoming quite technical. And let me tell you, yesterday I was just appreciating our events team even more and appreciating the communication team here. What it takes to set up any of these events it's a skill, it's a very highly marketable skill. Being able to evolve and look and see who's our audience, how do we reach them most effectively? Yeah. And being able to solve that real time consistently. It's also such an emerging area. So what are you seeing from where you are that can also help meet business needs? You know, there were some years back when we used to be banned from even accessing Facebook. Now it is somebody's job, and I was being educated on how TikTok algorithms work and how we can utilize that to put our brand out there. So also from your perspective, and keep researching. Yeah? Benson has spoken about visit their website. How much time do you take when you're on the internet to look at the organizations that you're interested in joining, getting to understand a bit about them, most of them tend to have careers portal. When you're on a website, just look careers or about us and then see which are the roles that they're also talking about there. You are in the world where LinkedIn is getting more and more active and there's so much more content and there's a lot of data being churned out of there. From your area of interest, take time, go through and just see. Whatever you're looking for, you will find it. And remember, you're praying about this. The Lord will open up paths for you, but let's keep looking out. But I do hope that you've taken this counsel and probably as we are breaking, you'll also get to engage with our panelists a little more. I think Gladys has spoken a bit about AI. I don't know if there's any one word you'd like to mention about AI in any other field before we now transition to talking about personal financial management. I think Gladys has covered it well. And so now we have spoken about our careers. And remember when um, CJ Emeritus spoke about how we pray for jobs, we pray for, career, uh, for promotions, then we get them. How do we stay grateful and how are we good stewards of what we earn from there? So I'd like to start with you, Marube. What is the importance of having a personal financial plan? Uh personal financial plan is your foundation of literally your life. Uh, because where we live, we live in a commercial world, we live in a, I would say a capitalist society. So we work, we till the land in Genesis, we earn, and from we, what we earn is what we, we eat. And so having a personal financial goal or you know, having that personal uh, financial literacy sets the foundation on how you are able to manage the resources that God has granted you. Because these resources aren't ours. We have earned them. God has granted them in our, has bestowed us with them. And it is from these resources, like the parable of the talents, that we'll be able to grow, develop, and multiply as the commandment in Genesis was. So we cannot be able to manage to grow or multiply if we do not have the personal financial discipline of earning uh, dutifully, saving, putting aside a safety nest, investing, and growing. So understanding uh, finance or stewardship at a personal level helps us to become aware of what we have and how to manage it. Because how, we, how well we do it at a personal level affects how well we do it you know, at the family or household level. 
it affects how we, well we do it at you know the corporate level is it a function is it the business is it in church is it you know where, wherever you are placed upon to manage so that personal level financial management is like the dna that replicates itself into the whole universe okay so you've had that dna it starts right from how you steward what's in your hand Benson? Yeah, when it comes to uh, financial plan, <coughs> personal plan is very important, just like Elder said. But my experience has been different. I think the time I was getting married, because of the family background, we didn't start our family as two. We started with the extended family in our family. <laughs> so, <laughs> when you talk of uh, by the time we had the firstborn, uh, we had other extended family. There was a time in our, fam in our family, apart from our daughter, we had other 10 dependents in the family. We were 13 in, the f in one family. So I'm bringing this to also bring in, we, sometimes you may not have an ideal family as you are starting your career. You may have other commitments that are, you are obliged to meet them regardless. Yeah, there were so many misfortune we, we met along. My sister passed away. I had to inherit the, her three children my brother, my wife, and everyone. So we're a number in our family. It's now that maybe they have grown up, they are now independent. We are now the core family, as it were now. But even in, the, uh, in such a situation, a, a personal family plan is important. You may be obliged to still extend a hand to the extended family, but being focused is also important. But maybe before we get there, it is also important to be faithful to God, even in tithe, return, and offering. And that's where it starts from. When you are committed and, and, and you, are, you are committed to God and say, as much as I have all these obligations to meet, but the first point of departure is to be faithful to God. God will resolve and sort out your issues. And that's maybe the point which I wanted to emphasize. When I started working, um, I was getting not much, a lot. Of, as I said, I started with a local contractor. I worked for seven months, but I resolved in my heart, as much as this is more, but I still have to be faithful to God. Now it is easier to retain tithe when you have you are getting small. Yeah? But when you grow up and your resources are more, when you look at the tithe and you say, should I retain all this? But the point is, uh, let, let's be faithful. God will sort out the rest as much as we may have our personal financial plans, but let's remember to be faithful to God. Thank you. Thank you for that. I noticed a few reactions from the audience as you spoke about eh? when the salary is at a certain level, yeah. it's a bit easier as it keeps growing. Yeah. Start early. It makes it easier as you go ahead. Okay, having a financial plan is very vital. I'm speaking as one who has had none at some point and one now who has begun to have one. When I had no any financial plan, for me, I, whatever came was mine. And uh, especially when you're beginning business and it's very tough at the beginning, then you get this wonderful uh, project and money comes. You see, it is time to repay all my sins and wash myself because I've been broke, isn't it? Now you see, now it is time to conquer. Eh? To reward, to reward to yourself. To reward really yourself. <laughs> they say to, to give your body some uh, sorry. So, but that is one thing I want to say, that you will not be young forever, by the way. There's a time that you'll come, that you will look at your future and imagine that, of course, they have spoken about God being the one that gives us resources. I will not talk about that. But remember that whatever comes to your hands, 
God gives us blessings for a reason. One, to be a blessing to his kingdom and to be a blessing to others. So when you include these things in your mind, that when money comes, just detach yourself from feelings. Having feelings for money is, is, is not good. Because if you have feelings for money, like there you have feelings for a, for, a, for a spouse. So for example, now you begin to have feelings for money. I am telling you, you can never plan for it. Detach your feelings and emotions from money so that you can be able to plan for it. And know that you will not be young forever. There's a time you will have the moment to make the money and there's a time that will come. Even the industry will begin to shift. Yeah. We're talking about AI right now. AI has shifted some jobs and some of the traditional jobs that we had can no longer hold. So what will you do if you never planned in future and saw a future where you can be able to save for yourself, save for your family, invest and do all these things. So the thing is, have it in your mind that these things are temporal, they are not ours, they are given, so we are stewards and begin to see the importance of really having that plan from that angle. Thank you, Gladys. Allow me to come back to Benson for just one moment. And you, start, you mentioned that you did not start as two when your family started. Uh, there's a term that we learned and has now become mainstream when we talk about black tax, which sounds like what you were alluding to. Please just um, encourage a young person out here who may be experiencing something similar. They're probably one of the ones who's doing better within their family and they're the needs of others coming behind them and they're called upon to contribute to that. How can they manage this? and still grow and still have their dreams and still end up in an international organization. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's a challenge when you look at it. Eh? Um, as much as now I talk about it, but at the that time where you had to buy two rolls of bread every day to feed, I mean, to, <laughs> to manage the, the large family, but along the way, um, God has been faithful, uh, trying to keep up those that you are supporting to be independent. And you find along the way. So the most important aspect when you look at this is to keep an eye on, your, on, your, on, on God, but also on what you want to achieve in life. I think the, the, the joy the biggest joy that I found in life as I have progressed is to make someone happy and to make someone independent. Um, as I said, like in my case, when my sister passed away, I took three children, I mean, three children of hers. Out of these three, two are graduates. One, one, one is run away from school and he went haywire. And out of these two, as we speak, one, she's in, in the UK, she found a job. So the joy that you find when you see someone whom you have supported and is independent, it's a greatest joy. So I would encourage uh, the young professionals here, as much as you, you would want to advance but there are some other obligations that you may not run away from. Please, through God's guidance, if you can still extend a hand of support, it will help you. You, you never know I'm here because of maybe the blessings that have come from supporting others. So it, it is important. Money will never be enough. Yeah. That's why even even... My former, I will give a, the example of my former president, Bakiri Muruz. You can give an example here, Uhuru. He is still in business. He still wants to have more. Money will never be enough. But I think the key element is to be contented with what God has given you at that particular time that you can also be able to extend a hand to others. It is very key. Thank you. Thank you. Just to add on to that, huh? the verse is uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Mm -hmm. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food 
and clothing, we will be content with that. Those that want to get rich fall into temptation and are trapped and, and, are trapped, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So uh, we live in a society where, uh, especially in Africa, uh, black tax in one form or another is, is, uh, is like here to stay. And um, the, the, what, what, what is different is the levels. Is the levels. You may have maybe one or two. In his case, he had 10. So it's that, the varying degrees that, that come into play. Because uh, once you have this kind of support that you give, uh, it, the reward may not be instant. In the human eye, it can even look like it's a loss. It's a depletion of or a a slowishness in a speed that you would have taken. But you never know, God blesses us in many other different ways. Yeah. You know, having good health, having, uh, uh, you know, good children, you know, people turning yes. out well, yes. are blessings that money cannot buy. So sometimes it's, a, it's, it's some of these things help us also to detach the feelings uh, Gladys was talking about towards money. because. There is no day that it will ever be enough that to say, now, this is it. This is enough. Thank you for that, Marupe. Someone said that we are Africans, and Africa is our business. Yes. So you find that the society we live in, today you are the one giving black tax, but tomorrow you are the black tax of someone. Mm. So what are you saying? If you have been someone's black tax, mm. You cannot now be tomorrow the one to say, I'm not going to give black tax. I've been a beneficiary of other people helping me within the family. So when I get an opportunity to help someone in the family, I don't see the reason I shouldn't. Remember, the word of God has really given us an encouragement to give. And sometimes I see people giving you know, in Haiti and giving in uh, Afghanistan, and they have not given in their own villages of Kisi. You see? So I'm not saying that you shouldn't give in uh, Haiti and Afghanistan. But sometimes we need to have priorities of we are one family. And the Bible actually says that if you do not take care of your own family, you are worse than a vagabond. You know, you are worse than an unbeliever. So I'm not going to say that we should not invest in helping the people within our family. Sometimes it goes beyond and uh, people take advantage of you and say that you are the rich uncle in, the, in, the, in Nairobi who should help us and they camp in your place. But remember, tomorrow you'll be the rich uncle who is bringing the rich uncle today. Tomorrow you'll be the rich uncle and people will be looking at you. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't give, but I'm also saying that even when you give, also remember that you also have other obligations. Instead of helping people by giving them hard out to eat, help them to build, you know, to build their capacity yeah. and help themselves and even help your children. You never know. Tomorrow is tomorrow. Thank you for that, Gladys. And as you're speaking, as I was listening to all of you, it reminded me of a theme we've adopted within our working space, and that's looking at personal growth. We've talked about promotions, right, and jobs, but we're now challenging ourselves that we rise as we lift others as well. And so when you get to that opportunity, you know your family, you know where you're from, do not be adversely influenced by all these other people around you who are from different backgrounds. And guys, it's different. Once you step out of uni, you know, we're, we're on different races, right? We don't all progress at the same rate. And it may mean that for some people today, yes, I have my younger brother, and I know that investing in him will set up our whole family for success. And it doesn't mean that I'll be lesser of a person in the future. We're all just mindful of what we have. I remember when I was younger, why requesting my brothers for any money? Man, I used to almost write a term paper. Not that they were mean, but they got me to really think and reflect, prioritize, then request. And so I think you also become a better steward of what you have, even as you're sharing. And then as you rise, don't we sing that song, Give and it shall come back to you, full measure. Let's, let's, let's take, let's believe in some of these. Let's keep sharing, let's keep building our prosperity together. And as you look at your expenses, because we've spoken about that, you'll then recognize what is necessary, what is not. 
and where you can stretch a bit more and it forms part of your personal character and remember it will actually spread out to other aspects of your character as a whole ladies and gentlemen with that we come to the end of this segment what do you say to our panel Thank you.